Today I want to talk about CrossFit. CrossFit. Touch your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, to bear your cross, you've got to be CrossFit. You may be seated. All throughout the scripture, Paul uses these athletic analogies to describe what it's like to be a Christian. Paul shares with us on several occasions how we are runners in a race. That race is not a sprint, rather it's a marathon. And then Paul begins to speak as though we are boxers who are training to perform at our absolute best. And this is important because if Christianity would be categorized as an Olympic contest, then it could be categorized as cross-bearing. That for those of us who are Christians, we have a responsibility and a duty to bear our crosses. Jesus said, if any man would be my disciple, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. And in a real sense, to be a Christian is not always easy. But it is, in fact, one of the most difficult and rigorous endeavors of mankind. Some days we have to deal with challenges and difficulties with holding our peace. We have to deal with trusting God in situations where we'd like to get involved ourselves. We have to deal with bearing our cross with the various struggles that come along with life and the life of being a Christian. Yet Paul wants to help us to understand how we can handle those struggles, but if you and I are going to be successful as believers, we've got to learn how to be CrossFit. I love this because if we're going to be successful spiritually, it's important for us to make sure that we exercise ourselves toward godliness. And that's the point Paul is making here in this particular passage of Scripture. He's writing to the Corinthians, helping them to understand that as believers, he understands that there are challenges, but he also pushes them and challenges them not to look at their troubles or their struggles as something that thinks less of them, but it shows that they have something inside of them that helps them to be able to overcome. And I don't want us to think like victims. I want us to think like victors. If you and I are going to be CrossFit, there's several things we got to do. The first thing, we must be deliberate. Let the church say deliberate. Yeah, I love this. Watch Paul. Paul says, I'm very deliberate and intentional about following Jesus Christ and growing in my relationship with God. Paul says, I'm careful how I spend my time and my energy and what I focus on. My number one goal and priority is to get closer to God, watch this, and to grow in him. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, watch what Paul says. Oh, that I might know him and the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. My number one aim in life is to get closer to God and to grow in him. And just like that's Paul's, his number one priority, that should be our number one priority. Our number one priority should not just be going after promotions or worldly success or gathering more things or getting our name known or all of the things that trap people in this life. Our number one goal and aim should be to get closer to God and to grow in faith and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But Christian growth and maturity and development does not come accidentally, it comes intentionally. It comes from you putting forth the effort and the determination toward making sure this happens. That's why you and I, catch this, have to measure every single thing we do against whether or not it brings us closer to God and causes us to grow in Him. Because if it doesn't tie into my priority and my purpose of getting to know God more, it could be a distraction I need to let go of. I want to know, does it help me learn? Does it help me grow? Does it mature me as a believer? Because if it doesn't push me closer to God, I got to learn how to let it go. Our number one aim should be to represent Jesus Christ in our lifestyle, in the way we conduct ourselves. And Paul, catch this, to make his case, uses the example of a runner in a race. Watch what he says. He says that a runner who's in a race, he's not racing, wasting his time. He's got his eyes on the prize. 
He says, a boxer, I train not like someone who's just shadow boxing, beating the air, but I train so that I can be able to win and be a champion. And as Christians, we should live our lives as if we are competing for a prize. We should be working to be the best that we can be, striving to overcome sin, to beat bad habits, to gain victory over vices, to overcome hurdles and hangups, to give God and the world our very best presentation of what it means to be a kingdom citizen. I love the Olympics, and when you look at the Olympics, all of those who compete in the Olympics are not just there to represent themselves, they're there to represent their kingdom. So when they go toward the Olympics, all of them have trained and conditioned and prepared themselves because now is a chance not only for them to represent themselves, but also to represent their kingdom and make people recognize that they are great people who come from where they are. So when they perform and when they do their contests, they make sure they do their very best. And when they fall short or fail, they're grieved, they're pained, they're hurt because they were there to represent their kingdom. That's how we got to see life as Christians. We're not just representing ourselves. We're representing the kingdom of God on our jobs, in our homes, in our communities, how we live. And when we fall short, we should be grieved and upset and say God forgive me I was trying to let the world see who you are through me but God if you give me another chance I'm going to get back up again I'm going to carry on and show the world that kingdom citizens are champions that's how we got to live watch what Paul says Paul says I am focused on my purpose and my goal and it should be our aim don't miss this to live in such a way To talk in such a way, to operate in such a way that men might see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Every day we step out, we should say, God, I know the world is watching me. So God, let me be the best representation of you and the kingdom of God that I can be. He's not only pursuing his purpose, number two under that point, catch this, he's pursuing perfection. Now, I know in Philippians chapter 3, watch what Paul says. Paul said, I have not attained to perfection yet. He says, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I know Jesus Christ, but I fall short. I make some mistakes, I don't always do things well. In fact, Paul gets so real, on one occasion, watch what he says, the good that I know to do, I don't always do that. Then the stuff I should stay away from, somehow I'm drawn toward it. Paul says, but in spite of all of that, I'm still pursuing perfection because Jesus is the measure and standard of perfection. So my goal is to raise up to the measure of Jesus Christ. And the reason this is important, because we live in a world where we have said as believers and the culture has created this sense of you can't be perfect, so why try? Yeah, 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 I know you can't be perfect. I know none of us will be perfect, but we should still strive toward perfection. We should still say, I'm still going to strive toward it even if I fall short. Even if I don't live up to what it means to be a believer, I'm still pressing to talk better, to think better, to act better, to live better, to treat people better, to operate better, to cut out the cussing, to cut out some of the stuff that messes up my testimony. I know I'm not perfect, but at the same time, I'm still pursuing perfection because Christ has called me to go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Carl Lewis was dubbed the Olympian of the century during his time. Carl Lewis was such a victorious champion on uh, the the field, uh, on the racetrack, that when he uh, was interviewed by one individual, they asked him, who does he compare himself to? Watch what he said. Carl Lewis said, I don't compare myself to anybody. I'm competing against perfection, the perfect time and the perfect performance. He says, so I don't even see the other people I'm competing with. I'm not paying attention to them. I'm competing with perfection. And he says, I am not mediocre. I am not lackadaisical. My goal is to reach perfection. I may fall short of it, but I'm still striving after it. See, the Bible says this, catch this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't compare yourself to other people. 
stay in your lane and focus on am I measuring up to who Jesus called me to be? Because if I measure myself against other people, there are some people who are further than me, but then there's some people who are behind me. So they aren't my measure. My measure is the perfect stature of Jesus Christ. So every day I'm getting up praying, God, take something else away from me. God, help me to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. God, help me to get to know you better. Help me to operate and live in such a way. Mark the perfect and upright man, and in him, he should be your example. But here's the culture we live in. Don't miss this. In the culture we live in, we have begun to lower the standard of Jesus Christ. Don't miss this. Even as Christians, please don't miss this. We have begun to lower the standard of what it means to be a believer. So we say, well, if I can just get in. If I just have my name on the road somewhere, if I, if I can just say I belong to that church. Y'all know people nowadays see a church like a Sam's Club card. They only use it when they need some groceries or to get something from it. Y'all ain't hearing me up in here. No, no, no. We ought to be rising up to the standard Jesus Christ has set. But we have settled and lowered the standard of what Jesus has set in the way we live, in the way we talk, in the way we think, in the way we treat people. We've lowered lowered the standard and adjusted ourselves to see certain things as acceptable when they're really not acceptable to God because God is calling us to another level but we've accepted it and lowered the standard to fit our needs and what we want to do. Okay, when I, when I was a kid, I wanted to dunk so bad. I played basketball every day, and as I was growing and maturing, I just knew eventually I'm going to be able to dunk. I watched all of the NBA players, and I studied guys in college, and guys my age at certain times and periods, they would have growth spurts, and I see them dunk. And in the middle of a game, I said, I want to dunk so bad. So I tried everything I could. We grabbed the nets and pull ourselves up and dunk the ball. We jumped, but I just could not dunk the ball. So, Brother John, I remember when uh, two friends of mine, Tony and Sean, his sons, moved in our neighborhood. Brother John installed a basketball court. And when he installed that court, it was an adjustable court. So the court could reach the standard of 10 feet. But then we could adjust it and bring it down. So we bring the court down, and I mean, I'm dunking. I'm doing windmills, 360s behind the back, and I'm feeling good about it because I've lowered the standard to fit what I could do at my level, not realizing it was lower in my game, that if I ever wanted to reach a higher level, I wouldn't do it having lowered the standard, but I have to keep on raising up to reach it. Y'all, we can't lower the standard of God. God has set a standard of how we ought to live, how we ought to talk, how we ought to walk, how we ought to conduct ourselves. Don't get comfortable because you're doing some of the stuff you're doing at your level. Is there anybody here who knows we go from faith to faith and from glory to glory and every day you ought to be striving to rise up a little bit higher in the Lord. But we lower the standard. Paul says, no. I, my goal is to see some change in my life to make sure I raise up to the full measure of Jesus Christ. You should want to win as a Christian. You should want to stop cussing, stop stealing, stop cheating, stop hating, stop fighting, stop being unfaithful, stop being bitter, stop living defeated, stop running with a loser's limp. You ought to want to be victorious. Matter of fact, have I got some victorious born again, blood washed believers up in this place who got the DNA of the resurrected Jesus Christ I dare you to decree and declare over your life, those habits are not going to hold me down that issue is not going to keep me I'm more than a conqueror shout unto God with a voice of triumph, don't wait till the battle is over, shout now you got to be deliberate somebody say be deliberate Number two, you got to be disciplined. Let the church say discipline. Watch what Paul is saying. He says, I buffet my body. He doesn't say, I buffet my body. I buffet my body. He says, I train, I work, I practice to be better as a believer. What we must understand is that God has called us to that same level of an Olympic champion. We ought to practice self-control and discipline. 
athletes, boxers, marathon runners work out for years, lifting weights, running miles, regulating their sleep, restricting their diet, getting up the train at times they don't want to, skipping holidays, and they're striving, striving to be the best that they can be. In fact, where Bishop Dan is from, Eldoret, Kenya, the fastest runners in the world come from Kenya. In fact, get this, the fastest runners come from where he's from. Eldoret, Kenya is known as the city of champions. At 4 o'clock in the morning, you can see runners getting up in the morning before the crack of dawn. Practicing, exercising, running, stretching, preparing themselves. That's why when they come to the States and run in races, it don't matter how hard you've been training. They're training at a whole other level. They've been working toward this in the same way. That's how we got to train as Christians. We got to learn how to train ourselves toward godliness. You got to train yourself to get up and pray when you want to sleep in. You got to train yourself to go to bed a little bit earlier the night before so you can get up and do devotion. You got to train yourself to open up your Bible and read it and study it. You got to train yourself when it rains on Sunday to say if I can get to work on time ain't no excuses for me not to get to worship. Matter of fact, I got to get to worship so I can get a workout because if I don't go to worship, I'm going to be weak the rest of the week. You got to train yourself when you're tired to still give God some praise. You got to train yourself to keep on pushing. You got to train yourself to think like a champion even though life is coming against you. Have I got some people up in here who train yourself? Matter of fact, the devil tried to get you to stay home. He wanted you to stream, but you trained yourself, got yourself up, and said, I'm going to give God the best praise that I got. Okay, here's what we got to understand. Professional athletes don't just train. Professional athletes also abstain. Okay, because to be an athlete... At a high level, it's not just exercise, it's also dieting. Okay, I want you to catch this. Uh, notice what Paul says, I buffet my body. That means there's some stuff my body wants to do, I don't let it do. I control it and I bring it under subjection. Professional athletes not only train, they also abstain. They abstain from anything that would conflict with them performing at their maximum level of performance. In fact, the professional athletes, their diets consist of nutrients, vitamins, and proteins that fit in line with their goals. So in order for them to stay in shape, maintain strength and energy so they can perform at their absolute best, there's some stuff they want to enjoy and indulge in, but they cannot. Because their goal is to be able to be a champion. So there's some stuff they desire and they want and their body wants, but it comes into conflict with who they're called to be. Okay, now all of us in here can testify if you're 30 and over that your, metabol your metabolism changes as you mature. Let me say it another way. Your metabolism changes as you mature. I sat down with my youngest daughter yesterday, and she said, I eat everything I want, and I never pick up weight. I said, it's not always going to be that way. Because those of us who are in here now know it's easy to put on, but it's hard to get off. Come on, there's some stuff you want to enjoy, you want to eat, but you know it's going to slow you down. It's going to make you depressed. Matter of fact, if you're dealing with depression, it could be connected with your diet. That there's some stuff that you're eating that's weighing you down, slowing you down, affecting your chemical imbalance. That's why you got to be careful what you take into your body. Can I tell y'all, at 42 years of age, I love bread and I love sweets. I mean, I love sweets so much so that I have to stay away from places because I will sacrifice certain parts of my meal just so I can have something sweet to go along with it. So sometimes I won't eat bread just so I can save some room for some dessert. I, I love sweets, but they don't love me back. I notice that some of the stuff I sit down and eat easy is hard for me to get off. So I learned to abstain from certain breads. I learned to eat before 7 o'clock. I learned that there's some sweet stuff 
stuff I want that I, that's not going to help me because I'm trying to stay in shape and sometime I will eat something sweet, indulge in some bread, try to get up the next morning and work out only to be disinterested, to be tired, to not want to do it. Y'all as Christians, there's some stuff that our body desires, but if you feed your body the stuff it desires, you are not going to be disinterested in God. You are not going to want to pray. You're not going to want to read his word. You're not going to want to come to church. You can't watch dirty movies, listen to dirty comics, listen to dirty music, indulge in dirty stuff, get the stuff that God don't want you to have, then wonder why you don't have victory in your life. No, you got to work out and pray. You got to say, God, I'm going to church. Then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, it's some stuff I'm not going to watch. It's some stuff I'm not going to listen to because it's going to mess up my spirit. How many of y'all in here know the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak? And if you want control over your spirit, you got to bring your flesh under subjection. See, the reason sometimes we don't have victory is because we're feeding our bodies everything it wants. Can I give y'all this? Your eyes, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Okay, when you feed all of this stuff into your spirit, I'm not being a legalist. Pastor, are you saying I can't listen to certain stuff? No, absolutely not. In fact, my wife and I enjoy culture. We enjoy entertainment. I took her to see Diana Ross last year, but y'all know there's certain places I can't go because it messes with my testimony, and it also rep messes with the representation I have of Jesus Christ. And then people I'm trying to get out of some places, they looking at me like, oh, it must be cool because pastor in here, y'all ain't helping me preach the full gospel on today. I want to know if some people still appreciate holiness is still right. Living right is still right. Following God to the letter is still right. Have I got some people? I'm going to do a roll call. Have I got some witnesses up in this place who can say, I know I ain't perfect, but I at least want a pastor who ain't living raggedy. I know I may not do everything right, but I at least want to be under an anointing that still honors God. Holler back at me if you hear me, just so I know I'm in the right house. Okay. It not only involves sacrifice, it involves submission. Watch what Paul says. I buffet my body. Bring it under the subjection. Submission. Subjection. I, I bring my body under subjection because the reality is our bodies want to do some stuff that's not agreeable with our spirits. Okay? Your spirit is redeemed, but your body is not. Your spirit is saved, but your flesh is still falling. So you got to starve your flesh and feed your spirit. You got to bring your spirit under the subjection of God. Our bodies are fallen. Our spirits are redeemed. So we got to bring our mind under the spirit, submit our spirits under God. And when we bring our bodies and our mind under God, it will change how we behave. Because what you believe determines how you behave. And if you get your brain worked on, if you get your mind renewed, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus with the renewing of your mind. The issue is your mind. If you could change your mind, It'll change how you move. If you change your brain, it'll change how you behave. So I got to bring my mind, body, and soul under Jesus every day. Pick up my cross and die daily to my flesh. Is there anybody here know the struggle is real? That some days I don't want to follow God. Some days I don't want to be nice to people. Some days I want to let the nutty professor out. Some days I want to let Mr. Clump go. Some days I want to really let you know how I feel. But I'm subjecting myself under the spirit of God lest I be disqualified okay touch somebody tell them crossfit to be crossfit you gotta cross train to be crossfit you gotta cross train what is cross training cross training is adapting disciplines in one area to another area that's why we grew up in the 80's bow nose bow nose baseball bow new football Bo could play just about everything. He was cross-trained in every field. And as an athlete, it made him more effective in every field because he learned disciplines in other areas. See, when we study and we pray and we fast, that's cross-training to keep us cross-fit. 
You can't just come to church. You need to pray. You can't just pray. You need the word. You don't just need the word. You need to fellowship with other believers. You need good music that edifies your spirit and pushes you closer to God. It's all cross training to keep you cross fit. Let me, let me say this. Paul uh, is also not just talking about uh, in terms of prayer and all those things. Paul also talks about fasting. Because I want you to get this. If you and I are going to be CrossFit, there's some fasting that has to be involved. Because watch this. Prayer and fasting is what gives us the victory. Fasting is when we push back the plate, concentrate on God, and allow him to fill our thoughts, our minds, and our spirit. In fact, Paul says, I fast more than most people. He says, I fast, watch this, because there's a connection between my flesh and my spirit. So I starve my flesh to feed my spirit. And when I do that, watch this, fasting is resistance training. It's giving me the ability to resist some stuff. So fasting gives me the strength to resistance and train myself. Because if I can turn down some cakes and some cookies, if I can turn down a hamburger and a pot pie, if I could turn down for a moment or a season some stuff that's good for me, I can get rid of some of this stuff that's bad for me. So I got to discipline myself, buffet myself. I got to bring myself under subjection so that I can be stronger in the spirit you want to know why i fast for 24 hours on wednesdays because i'm buffeting my body i sat down at a luncheon the other day and they had some nice fancy expensive food on wednesday and i was so tempted to eat it because i didn't want to be anti-social and the people were saying they beat me there oh the food is good try the dessert you ought to indulge i didn't know how to tell them i was fasting and then one part of me said why don't you indulge you don't want to be anti-social but then the spirit said wait a minute you ain't made it to Sunday yet and in order for you to be able to preach with power you got to push back the plate you got to sacrifice let them think what they think you got a different kind of cross to bear and if you're going to be crossfit sometime you got to make some sacrifices I wish I had some people up in this place who knows when you sacrifice for God God will bless you as a result of it okay. you got a number one be determined. Let the church say be determined. Number two, you got to be disciplined. Let the church say be disciplined. Number three, you have to be determined to go the distance. Okay, here's, here's what Paul is saying. You got to be deliberate. You got to be disciplined. You got to be determined. Okay, I may have reversed that with y'all. Uh, you got to be, you got to be deliberate. That's intentional. You got to be disciplined and then you got to be determined. Watch what Paul says in closing in verse 27. He says, I buffet my body, bring it under subjection, lest I preach to others and I myself be disqualified. Now catch this. Paul is not referring to losing his salvation. What Paul is referring to is rewards. Because all of us who are believers who are in here, are not only li living in this life, but when we get to heaven, God is going to judge us based upon how we lived our lives as believers. In fact, can I tell you in this passage of scripture, all of those who had listened to Paul and heard this word, every educated mind in the first century immediately knew and understood the warning. Their minds begin to think of the runner's track in Athens, Greece. In Athens, Greece, my wife and I went about three years ago. When we went to Greece, we went to Athens. In Athens, there is the Colosseum. In the Colosseum where the runners have the track placed, there's not only the seats in the stands, there is a seat for the judge called the Bema seat. The Bema seat is where the judge's view is unobstructed. He can see every runner and how they are performing. At the Bema seat, he is able to watch them during their race. And then after the race, from the Bema seat, he 
hands out rewards to the runners based upon their performance. What Paul is saying is just like that. All of the believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We are not going to stand before the white throne of judgment. That's for those who don't know Jesus. But we will stand before the bema seat of Christ. Paul in 1 Corinthians said every man's work will be measured whether or not it's wood, hay, or gold. Everything that is not pure and everything that doesn't fit with God is going to be burned like dross. We will be handed rewards based upon how we lived our lives as Christians. And I don't know about y'all. When I get to the other side, I want to hear well done that good and faithful servant. I want God to see how I manage my money. I want God to honor me for how I dealt with my enemies. I want God to honor me for how I live my life. I want God to honor me for how I resisted temptations. I want God to honor me based upon my diligence and dedication. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. And every day I'm trying to do better. Every day I'm trying to press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Because I know one day I will wear a crown. Maybe I didn't set you up for that right. Let me back up. Uh, you missed that. Watch what Paul says. Paul says, I run with the end in focus. I'm not just looking at today. I'm looking at tomorrow. We don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Watch Paul. Paul doesn't say his race is over until 2 Timothy chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, watch Paul. Paul is getting ready to face Nero's chopping block. He's getting ready to be beheaded. He's in prison in 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's his last will and testament. And watch what Paul says to Timothy in his last will and testament. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have ran my race. I've kept the faith. And now there's a crown in store for me. But not only is there a crown for me, there's a crown for all of those who have loved his appearance. Paul said it ain't over till it's over. Oh, I feel like preaching up in this place. Paul said I stumbled along the way on the track. I fell short a few times. I, I lagged behind some of the others in the race. But now now I've come to the end. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my race and I kept the faith. I just stopped by to tell you on the day, Christian don't throw in the towel. I know it gets difficult and it gets discouraging. I know you got trials and tribulations, but you got to keep on running the race. Keep on fighting the good fight of faith. Your praying is not in vain. Your giving is not in vain. Your living is not in vain. Your worship is not in vain. Your praise is not in vain. Your lifestyle is not in vain. You keep carrying your cross. No cross, no crown. But if you keep on picking up your cross, if you keep on subjecting your flesh, if you keep on honoring God, I promise you on the other side, there is a reward. And I wish I had somebody here who could say, I'm pressing on the upward way. Brand new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm upward bound. Lord, plant my feet on solid ground. If anybody asks you, what's the matter with me? Tell them I'm saved, I'm sanctified, and I'm running for my life. Have I got a witness here? I dare you to give God some praise. Give God some glory. Give God some praise. Give God some glory. Shout glory. Shout glory. Glory. Glory! Have I got some big toys all over this house? Open up your mouth and shout if you know you're a conqueror.